six weeks later, I'll then go back to the original story and then I'll see it with sort of fresh eyes and I'll just kind of, that's when I start to myself, you know, what the hell were you thinking right in this? Hello friends, welcome to the show. My guest today is a horror and thriller writer whose early works were snapped up by publishers, launching a career that is poised to make some big leaps over the next couple of years. We chat about his debut novel, just relaunched with a new edition, Publishers, Agents and Ghosts. He's a goldmine of information for new writers and a great writer for dark fiction fans. I'm Jack Rollins and today's fiendish mind is Michael Bray. Michael, good to have you here. Hello, how are we doing? I'm good, thanks. How's your day going? Uh, it's not too bad. Enjoying some rare sunshine. It's all good. Do you find it easy to write even with the good um, weather distracting you? It'd probably pull me away more if I could go to a pub, but because I can't go to a pub, I kind of tend to stay where I am and, and do what I should be doing. Yeah. Procrastination is not as um, intense at the minute. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. That's the thing. I do miss a beer, like I've got to admit, out in the pub. Um, be a garden weather, most definitely be a garden. Well, I figured we, we would dive right in, we'd, uh, that we'd go back to the beginning, Michael. So, yeah. you know, just well, tell everyone about when you started writing. When did you really get serious about writing fiction? Uh, yeah, it, it, it was actually kind of by accident. I, when I was a kid, I kind of dabbled on and off with sort of short stories and things, but nothing too major, which is sort of for a hobby. I was in creative things, I was into art when I was a kid. Um, Got into music, joined a band that did quite well with some recording, did a bit of touring, which was quite good. In about 2011, 2012, that kind of fell apart, essentially. It stopped being a thing. Um, I was looking for some sort of a creative outlet, and I thought, oh, I'll try and pick up the writing again. Started on a few short stories, which would become Dark Born as my first collection. They went quite well. I submitted a few, got some good responses. Got some some published, better paid published work, which is quite good. Then one of the short stories from that, then became the book that would go on to be Whisper, which we'll probably go into in a little while. But it just kind of went from there, and I just kind of more I did it, and I was getting some success, and I was getting some good reviews. I thought, well, you know, we'll have a proper, proper bash at this. It just really escalated from there. You know, I sort of fell into a good habit, got into a good routine. It all went well from there. You mentioned being in a band, and you're, you're in the Leeds area, aren't you? Yeah. Yes. There used to be a really good band scene down there, didn't there? It used to be really good. There's some really, really good venues. A lot of them are closed now. Um, we played in a few of those places called the Cockpit. It was really, really good. I remember it, uh, we yeah. We played there a few yeah. times. It was what it was for. It was really, really good. A lot of big bands there. But I don't think it's so good now. A lot of those venues are shut down now. A lot of music venues, it's not what it used to be. It's more yeah. clubs and things now, which is a shame. But uh, we had some really good times doing it. You know, we got to tour. We got to play everywhere. We played Camden, uh, Camden Town and everything in London. Wow. So we got, we got to go everywhere. So it was good. Yeah, um, I used yeah, to live down your neck of the woods for a few years. Oh, you did? Uh, yeah. Back till about 2010, so I was in the cockpit quite frequently. I used to work around the corner from there on Ball Lane. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. So I used to go down the, the back steps and... Yeah, of course. Yeah, a bit, bit shady at times, but it's okay. if you With a group, you're okay. Like, with ah, a bit, bit shady by yourself. <laughs> ah, good, good night, eh? Uh, dry dock. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Used to love dry dock. What was this the one? dry dock weather. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Up on the, a boat in the middle of Leeds. Yeah, so random. Great. So random. Um, I used to like, uh, where else did I used to drink? What was the one where you used to go downstairs? It was up by Millennium, Millennium oh, Square. Um, that was really good for bands. I forget what it's called. Carpe yeah. DM. Yeah. Carpe yeah, DM. Really good. That's the one. That yeah, was a great little time drink. Again, shoot lots of students when it's full. Really yeah. nice atmosphere. I'm off down memory lane with you now. You see, you yeah. just mentioned Leeds and I'm away, but. That's it. If only we'd known each other back then. There you go. Strange. A few beers. That was pre-recluse. I don't really go out as much now. I just kind of punch over my keyboard and type things like so. <laughs> but now with this lockdown, at least we've got an excuse to be reclusive. Mm. That's it. Going back to the writing then, since I've dragged yeah. us off down a little rabbit hole there. That's fine. Where, do you, where yeah. does your work sit genre-wise? Well, I always think of it as kind of dark psychological uh, stuff. It's, it's not kind of, it's not extreme. It's more kind of suspense building and a lot of the newer things I've been writing which have not been released yet they tend to sit more definitely on the thriller side like a dark thriller side there's not a whole lot of supernatural elements in them um mm. but I kind of like that um it's that, that kind of that Jaws approach I kind of I like to explore you know what you don't see and what you don't hear it's that kind of anticipation and building it up for the reader and kind of 
you know, suggesting things as, as a story unfolds. Yeah. I kind of like that. Uh, I like working in sort of those grey areas that everyone's got. Uh, I don't believe in good or bad people. There's yeah. some sort of shades of grey that everybody's got. So I like to kind of explore those and have like flawed characters on each side, both good and bad. Yeah. So that's my kind of, that's the kind of thing that I like. And of course I like the old, um, I love things like Tales from the Crypt, uh, Tales from the Dark Side, Twilight and so I like those kind of twist endings for things as well. Yeah. So I always try and kind of take the order and make it a little bit unusual and mm. kind of make it a little bit kind of different to what you might expect. Yeah. And do you, do you enjoy writing short fiction more than novel length pieces or does it just depend? Of course. I mean, I think that I enjoy both, but they're, they're very different disciplines for me. Short fiction, I'll just kind of get an idea and I'll go with it and I'll just write it. I won't kind of give any thought to where it goes. Uh, long fiction, I tend to have kind of a beginning, middle and an end in my head and I will kind of bullet point chapters, but I don't always stick to that. I may go off at a tangent at some point. We we're talking about Whisper. Uh, my first major novel well, that was actually it started life as a short story for Dark Corners yeah. I was just writing it and writing it and writing it before I realised I had like 35,000 words I was like, nowhere near the end so I was like well let's just carry on with this and we'll see where it goes and, yeah let's you know, it turned out uh, to be did you keep you know, did you keep the, the short version of that did you keep the that original I've, short I've story got it, yeah, yeah. I've, I've actually got it somewhere it's around I think the short version is around nine pages I think, or something that might be the unedited first draft of the novel was 122,000 words, so it was a bit of a <laughs> yeah, monster. <laughs> Big difference, yeah. So it's it just it kind of just, just took a life of its own. It's like well, I'm not going to kind of stamp on it just to kind of fit it into a short story book. I'll just carry on and I'll see you know where it takes me. And, right. So it, it never hit. It, it wasn't in dark corners in a short form then. No, no. It, this was during the comp- when I was compiling the stories for dark corners. This is one of the stories I was intending to include uh, yes. within it when I started writing it, but then. During the writing process, it took a life of its own. So I kind of I see. set it to one side, finished the stories for Dark Corners, and jumped back on that straight away. And I was kind of writing that and another book called Meet at the same time, a vampire thing. So I was kind of doing three projects at once early doors. I don't tend to do that now. I tend to stick to one at a time. But, yeah. You know, all that enthusiasm when you first start and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but I find, I, I find that just trips me up. I just start... Yeah. Yeah, I used to, I used to do it, but I think I think now it's like one at a time. But it's annoying when you kind of three quarters through something and you get an idea for something else that you really really want to write, and you have to kind of okay, don't just wait. And you can do it like, as a reward when you eventually finish this story. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> when you when you are sat writing, because I I do want to come back to whisper. Yeah. But when you are sat writing, how much planning goes into it? Do you have any writing rituals? Do you have to have you know a certain room, a certain light, a certain music? How do you like to work? Well, for a time, I was able to. I was lucky enough. I was able to do it full time as my job for four years. Mm-hmm. Um, and the plan was then it was to kind of treat it as a job. So I converted the spare room into an office, put the desk in there, had set time, so I'd get up, start work early, no distractions, you know, like no TV, nothing like that. So it has to be kind of the best thing is to remove any sources of distraction from you, anything that can kind of take you away from what you're doing, because it's so so easy, especially when you're working from home. It's so so easy to get distracted by TV or yeah. PlayStation or whatever you know. It's, it's so so easy for anything to kind of drag you up, and before you know it, you've you know you've wasted half a day and you've not got any work done, and then that can just kind of drag on and drag on. Uh, so I think routine's important to get into a habit, even if it's only you know 500 words a day, 1,000 words a day. Do something every day, and you know you'll soon take those pages off. Yeah. Do you heavily plan out your plots? I do for the long fiction. So uh, the, the book I'm working on now, it's quite complex. It's, it's on three different timelines over a 40 year period. So I had to kind of plot that out as far as, you know, where each storyline went and then they kind of interweave into each other. Yeah. So normally I'll, I will sort of bullet point chapter by chapter, sort of one to two paragraphs per chapter as to kind of what happens and where it goes. Mm, and then yeah. if I do find myself as I write it kind of go in a different direction, I'll just kind of let it go. I won't just stick rigidly to the outline. It's just to help me to know where the beginning, middle and end is. Yeah, uh, and I may go off at a tangent and come back to kind of weave back into those, you know, those major areas, and eventually get to the end point. Yeah, I suppose as well that the added complexity, because even on a on a fairly a linear, single yeah. timeline story, you're wrestling with, you know, which order am I going to play out the events? How am I going to tease them yeah. out and maintain suspense or deliver a surprise or a shock? Yeah, and I think it's that thing as well where you kind of you're trying to you're trying to get your characters across to your readers. You're trying to kind of develop the story but without getting too much exposition and giving too much at once and kind of putting big text bumps of, of bar and stuff it's just kind of yeah. drip feeding it in a way in kind of small chunks and then 
we may revisit that later rather than give a huge exposition dump and, and kind of lose the interest of the reader. It's kind of not knowing where to jump off and where to kind of, you know, to, to cut yourself short a little bit. I've been looking at some of the publishers I've worked with have been really strict editing wise and have helped me out massively. Yeah. As far as, you know, giving me a bit of a kick in where I need it and say, that's too long, you need to, you know, <laughs> kill that off, you know, don't do it. Yeah. Anything, but I appreciate it. It's, it's helped me improve over time, over time, over time. So. Yeah, I suppose you get used to bits that you've just put in for you and then which bits are healthy to have as an app within yeah. the book. Yeah. I know I've written whole cha- chapters even recently on, on my current work in progress where I've, even as I'm writing the chapter and I think this isn't going in the book. No. I, I know that it's getting cut, but yeah. I'm having to write it for me because I need that little thing that's going to take this person from A to B. Yeah. I know that retrospectively I'm going to take it out and then I'm going to, I'm going to uh, summarize it and just make it you know, yeah. work in a different way. But it's a chapter that I need to write, not that a reader needs to read. Yeah. So. The, the worst ones are the ones where you think you like it, you think you need it, and then when it comes to editing, you realize that you don't need it. <laughs> it's like, oh, get rid of that. Can't use that. You know, they're the worst <laughs> ones. But, yeah. Um, but it's good. I, mean, I actually like, I really like the whole process of sort of editing and tweaking. I kind of, in a way, I prefer that to actual writing. I see the mm-hmm. writing is just kind of getting everything out of my brain and onto the page and then the actual editing part is kind of shaping what is on there into kind of a coherent story so a lot of my first drafts are horrendous the horrible you know I don't spell check or anything I just I just sit down I literally write I don't correct typos or anything I just write the whole thing so I have like a 90,000 word manuscript full of typos and errors and little sort of ideas and little you know yeah, <laughs> little, yeah. Sort of little notes and things are horrible horrible things so editing tends to take me a long time but that's just how I like to work yeah, but then you get to the end of the book. You've written it. Yeah. yeah. See, my thing is I've worked the opposite way to you yeah. and I correct and I fiddle yeah. and I faff on with stuff. And by time you've, you, you know, you've maybe typed 2,000 words, but you've actually only contributed 1,000 words to the yeah. the word count of the project. Yeah. They talk about something as the internal editor. And I, yeah. I really have a game on shutting mine down, you know, and get on, yeah. get the story told, trying to get better at it. But it sounds like you've got that under control, just getting the story out, get draft yeah. one in. I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a valid way to work. I mean, I'm not saying it's a, there's a right or a wrong. I think everybody, as you know yourself, everybody's got their own kind of way that works for them as far as how they kind of get everything. I, I just, I know like if I don't get everything from the story, if it's a novel, if I don't get everything down within three months onto page, it'll just sit and it'll never ever get finished. It'll just sit there and sit there because I'll just kind of, lose interest almost in, in actually writing the content down and I'll have other ideas of other things that I want to do. Yeah. Um, so it's important to me just to, once the idea is in there, outline it, get it down in some form so I've got at least a version and then from there, you know, tweak it, edit it and then start doing all the, the work to make it readable. God, I'm pleased we're having this conversation, you know, because just you, just you saying that phrase there, if I haven't got it done in three months, you know, that there is... That's ringing a bell with me. I'm thinking, Jesus, I need that discipline, man. I need to just go get this done three months. Yeah. There's my draft. Then work with it. And, you know, you said that you actually particularly enjoy coming back to do the edits to lift the best yeah. version of the story. So many yeah. writers don't like that process. Well, it's that thing. I mean, it's, I know a lot of writers do it. Like, I'll finish a draft, say that I'll spend three months writing a version. Uh, I'll just put it aside. I won't do anything. I'll normally go up and I'll write four or five short stories just to kind of get novels out of my system even if I don't do anything with them I'll just write them and file them away uh, I did that last year and I submitted a couple which uh, got published afterwards mm. and then five six weeks later I'll then go back to the original story and then I'll see it with sort of fresh eyes and I'll just kind of that's when I start myself you know what the hell were you thinking right and just <laughs> you know start like, shouting at myself and and deleting and editing and all that sort of stuff but it, it's a process that worked I mean it's been working since 2012 so why change it exactly <laughs> so Whisper yeah. was traditionally published. Yeah. It's now re-released. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that process? And then we'll go into the, yeah. the book um, itself. I mean, it was Whisper was a bit of an accidental success. Um, it was the first novel of any substance I'd ever written. I was quite new to the industry. So I'd read upon self-publishing. I was a bit not confident enough at that point to submit to major mm-hmm. publishers or anything. I was brand new. So, well, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be any good at this. We'll, we'll self-publish it. So I had it edited, um, got some cover work done. Nothing nothing extravagant. But yeah, for a few weeks, I didn't do anything. It was selling maybe three or four copies a day. I, I remember vividly I woke up one day, it was Thursday. And I checked, logged onto Amazon, checked my KDB account, and it had done 
312 copies. I was like, you know, no idea why, no rhyme or reason. Wow. Uh, check the next day, 700 copies the day after, 812 copies. It was like bloody hell, man. Crazy. Um, it just started going mental from there. It was going crazy. Um, Graham Reynolds is, he runs a horrific tale press. Uh, brilliant publisher, nice guy. You know, top guy. Not a bad word to say about him. He got in touch with me about potentially taking it on. Mm-hmm. So we had some discussions. He offered me a contract and a nice advance. So we sold the book to Horrific Tales and they've had the rights from then until now, um, obviously. And we did two sequels after that, which were unplanned at the time. <laughs> um, it was just at the time that recently the um, the contract term had, had come to an end. And as much as I was perfectly happy with Horrific Tales, you know, no, no issues with them whatsoever, no complaints. I just thought it'd be time to kind of bring them back under my own yeah. ownership. Because there is kind of half a plan to because I wrote them in 2012 and there's some things in there that I want to kind of maybe readdress. So I was thinking of maybe doing new edits of them maybe next year or the year after when time permits, mm. um, and maybe just make a few tweaks and make a few changes to things that, looking back now, are kind of something that I'd like to address. I mean, I love the books and you know people tend to like reading them and I really love the books, but and I can't thank Graham and Horrific Soul Publishing enough because they did ridiculous amounts of work they put so much effort in to promote it and advertise yeah. and, you know get them out there and i think they hit uh, number one in america in the uk two or three times during the time of graham in the charts so i don't know quite how many were sold but it's multiple thousands i'm not sure how many yeah. it's, it's no, a it's, lot, a lot it's, sold. i mean when you think when you were putting it out on your own those yeah. kind of numbers you, that you that you're talking about i mean that's phenomenal yeah. I, i'll be honest with you i might have been tempted not to not to part with it originally. If if I was getting those numbers, you know, selling three hundred and seven hundred in a day and things like that, I'd be kind of thinking, hey, I'm keeping all the money for me. <laughs> I thought about it, but then it was kind of I was so new to the industry, I didn't really know kind of what to do. Yeah. And I was kind of thought, well, if I go with somebody who's, who's kind of, you know, they've, they've clearly got some money to to do the advertising, those brand new things, had no kind yes. of capital to put into it to sign promotion and advertise, and then those sales numbers will only last for so long unless you kind of invest in advertising and promotion. Yes. You know, and at the time it was, it was a good advance, it was a lot of money at the time. It's like, well, you know, these guys clearly want it. You know, I knew Graham, I'd read some of his, but I'd read his high moral books, which if you've not read them, are really good. Um, his werewolf books are really good. Um, I'd already read those, so I was already a fan of his work as a writer. You know, I just, I, I don't regret it whatsoever. It was good, it was a good move. I think it was a good move for me at the time. It was mm-hmm. tempting to kind of just sit on it and wait and see, but it could have easily been a flash in the pan. You know, it could have dropped it down to four and fives again. No, I mean, obviously, it's been a a sensible move because it's opened up yeah. a lot of doors, hasn't it? And they've remained popular, it those is. stories. And a bit, of a bit of an exclusive as well. I'm kind of close to, um, I don't know. Well, I'll say it anyway, because it's not an official, but we're close to getting a, a film signed off. Oh, very as well. good. And um, did you write the script? Probably a year after next, I'm going to be writing the script. Oh, right. So it's... Yeah, so it's going to be... Well, I'm going to be co I'm going to be writing the script. It's going to be with team of other people essentially I see. so they've approached um, you off the the book this isn't a screenplay yeah, well, that I've you've been pitching of, um, around i've done a little bit of screenwriting for a few of the people since mm-hmm. i've done some sort of short films and stuff and i've been working with a few you know like-minded people yeah and um, we just got to talking about it and you know we I, I sent over the ebook of whisper just said this is what i'm kind of going to be shopping around do you want first option on it and I had a look, and they, they seem really keen. Obviously, I, I can't go into too much detail yet, because there's going to be more yeah. for a release down the line, but that's looking good for uh, possibly 2022, possibly. We'll see. But, Exciting um, stuff. Yeah, it would be, be nice to see it, because that's one thing readers always come up to me about, is that like, when are we get a film, we need a film or a TV series. Like, if it was up to me, you'd have one. It's not as easy as Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everyone a little bit about Whisper then. What's it about? When's it set? Where's it set? Well, it's set, it's kind of, this is one of the things, it's kind of, when I wrote it, it was set in kind of like the English countryside, but by accident, the story's got kind of an American feel to it. So it's kind of set nowhere specific. It's kind of an anywhere place. It could be in the UK, it could be in the US. Uh, it's mm-hmm. about a young couple who uh, want to get away from the city, the sick of all the the pollution and the noise, which is, you know, it's one of those standard kind of cliche stories on paper as far as a setup for a story. So they buy this cheap rundown uh, cottage in the woods, weird things start happening around them. And it turns out to be quite a bigger 
story than, than on the surface. On the surface, it's a standard ghost story, but the more you dig into it, it's got a bit more mm. intrigue as far as the people who live in the village and the sort of other things that have been kept quiet. Uh, there's a human element villain, which is one of my favourite characters I've ever written, a guy called Donovan. Donovan. Um, sleazy, horrible <laughs> guy, bastard. but so much fun to write. Yeah, there you go, that's the one. He's a, he's a <laughs> um, um, You know, he was good fun to write. Him and there was a character similar to him in, in the third book, which is also equally as nasty, but he was so much fun to write and just kind of explore that human element of horror which are quite like rather than supernatural and human elements kind of coming together yeah and this couple are kind of stuck in the middle trying to kind of come to terms with what they believe what they don't believe what which part of it's as a result of the human interference and which part of it's because of the um supernatural elements and things like that so it's kind of it takes you on a little bit of a journey and we, and we also see flashbacks we go back to the house's construction in the 1800s and we see kind of how its origins and how it came to be and we jump between those his- historical segments to modern times, sort of chapter, not chapter, not quite every other chapter, uh, but maybe every second or third chapter will go back and we'll get yeah. a little bit more of the story. Yeah. Um, that was one of the, the edits Graham suggested because initially it was every other chapter. So mm-hmm. we had a modern day chapter and then a historical chapter and it turned out to be too much. So we yeah, cut out, like... I think we cut out five or six of the flashback chapters and moved the ones that we had around so that we'll spread out a little bit further throughout the book. Which was a really yes. good call in the end. And there's um, a there's a section. The time. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, th- there's a section that's more like uh, epistolary fiction, isn't there, where we see like yeah. the 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 letters between uh, two of the characters in historical yeah. segment segment. Was that how you did that come from eliminating some of those other? No, 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 that was already in there. That that was already des- that was already that was already designed to be in there. The other the other chapters that were in there were similar to the. The, the separate sections where there's kind of it's just events that had taken place and how you know previous occupants of the house and you know things that happened to them and they all came sort of nasty gruesome endings. My favourite mm. one is the this is there's a scene where a guy cuts up his ears and starts eating dirt, which is a bit strange, like, but uh, that one stayed in there. But I think it worked well. That was one of those things where having the benefit of horrific tales at the time in their editing team to kind of because if it was such me, I'd have left it. I think the original the first draft was 120 something thousand words. Uh, mm. I think the Horrific Tale release came in at about 86 or 89, so we cut quite a lot of yeah. content out of it. But pace-wise, it was definitely the right call because it just kind mm. of tightened everything up and it made it a more cohesive story as it was. Yes. So, yeah. And I think from a, not that I'm, you know, in a, I don't know their business model, but certainly in terms of putting out paperbacks, I think 80,000 is kind of that sweet spot, I think, for, yeah. you know, where the book, it, it's a novel. But it's also yeah. not so bloated that you know people are having to pay. You know, people don't want to pay thirteen ninety nine for a paperback. Not not today. You can't you can't be charging that now. It's just, just people won't pay that now. It's I think people want kind of because ebooks are so cheap. I think it's kind of yeah made it difficult to get competitive pricing for your paperbacks because ebooks are so cheap now. Unless you're a major publisher and you charge a fortune for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fourteen quid for an ebook. <laughs> <laughs> How much was that, sorry? 14 quid for an e-book. I can't remember who it was. I saw one online the other day, an e-book for 14 quid. Disgraceful. Crazy. Absolutely Crazy. disgraceful. Makes you wonder what they'll charge for a hardback. They'll want blood. Yes. Where did the uh, initial idea for Whisper come from? Weirdly, um, I used to work in Lee City Centre, so on the bus I used to get to work. It was always packed on the morning, so I was, just, I was upstairs in the same seat pretty much on the morning. Mm-hmm. And it used to drive past a um, an old sort of an old sort of rundown church house type thing on a back onto a cemetery. And the original idea was like, it'd be so weird if kind of lived in a house that backed out onto a cemetery, mm-hmm. and then weird things started to happen. And that's the kind of the short version. That's what the short version is. But we kind of dropped that whole element out of the actual book, and they're just kind of in the woods. And it just kind of came from that. By the time we got to work, I'd had kind of three quarters of the idea of the plot in my head, and then. I got home, started writing, and you know, rest of stuff. I think that entire book took me around three weeks to write from start to finish. Bloody was, hell, that's been some going. Yeah, just every that's every minute of every day. It was like so quick to get it down on paper. It was just it was just you know when you get in that you know when you get in the flow and you just can't kind mm-hmm. of doesn't happen so much these days. But back then, it's like, you know, just get into it. It's a bit harder work these days. But well, um, family and yeah, things. It, it, it tends to get quick. Yeah, know? very good. Uh, 
and it was one of those where it feels, you know, when you've finished a project and you look at it and you think, I've got a good feeling about this. It was one of those where you think, I think this might be okay, you know. Yeah, good. Yeah. It's nice when you get that feeling, isn't it, where, where you think, I'm on a bloody winner here. Just yeah. hope everyone else thinks so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get, it's good, man. We get that. But it, it's tricky because some of the times it gets to the point where, I don't know if it's just me, but usually around the halfway to three quarters point, I'll hit a massive roll and I'll find it really difficult to make any progress in the novel. I'm mm. like a little bit where I hit a wall between halfway and three quarters through. Yeah, how, how am I going to bring it home? Fight. Yeah, it's a massive, massive fight. Then when I get to the point where, you know, I'm on the final stretch, things sort of pick up again and pick up first. But that halfway to three quarters mark is always a big, big, big um, problem. Not problem yeah. for me, it's just it's difficult to get through. It's hard to do the right for her. <laughs> and you said before you hadn't planned it as a trilogy, but no. we got echoes and voices from the same uh, yeah. initial setting. What may, what drove you to, to to add those, you know, to, to draw more upon that mythology and expand it? Honestly, initially, the first one was doing so well. I thought, well, you know, people clearly want more of it. I was getting 40 or 50 messages a day from readers and asking if there's going to be a follow-up to it. Although I think the first one ended, it ended sort of as a self-contained story. It didn't kind of imply any sequel would come because at the time it was just going to be a singular novel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'd kind of, I'd closed a lot of the, potential avenues to do anything else with it at the time. Yes. I was getting so many, so much feedback from readers. I spoke to Graham and they said, well, you know, would you be potentially interested if we did a sequel? And they were. Um, I had to go away for a couple of weeks and kind of think, well, do I want to do this? And, and do I want to do this if I can't kind of make it a worthwhile addition to the story? Mm-hmm. Because if I, if I can't make it worthwhile and a valid follow-up, I don't just want the kind of rehash book one into book two because I don't see any point in that. No. So unless it could bring sort of a valid reason to kind of revisit these characters and these places, then I wasn't going to do it. So I spent two or three weeks just thinking, and eventually, just by chance, I kind of came across a little spark of an idea, and I thought, well, that could work. And then just from there, it just kind of snowballed out. And within a week, I had book two and book three kind of potentially, you know, outlined in my head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um. And one thing people say about the trilogy is you can read them all as a trilogy, but each story, each book is an individual self-contained tale by itself, but it's also part of a bigger overall story. Well, I've read that's what I was going for. I've well, I've read Whisper and I very much enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, one thing I say is you're not frightened to put your characters through the mill. That's all part of the fun. All part of the fun. I love doing that. Yeah, I mean, it. it you know, it, it, there's some bit. It, it's a like a slow burner that you know figuring yeah. things out but i tell you what that third act jesus christ did just hammers through yeah it picks up i mean that, that was very much deliberate i kind of wanted to the idea was to gradually sort of ramp up the tension and then when things mm. just get into a head in a chapter I have, i'll just cut away and go somewhere else completely different characters different mm. scenario completely so just leave that bit gone yeah and then do the same with that chapter then we'll go back to where they were again it's just kind of that Quite short chapters. I'm one of those writers that write quite short chapters. I don't like a lengthy chapter. Mm. So I like to keep them short and sweet and then leave them on a bit of a cliffhanger. Yeah. Which, again, it's just a little trait of. Well, that's the page turner, isn't it? Is, yeah. Cliffhanger that's chapters. Hope, that's the hope that people are kind of, well, need to see, you know, see what goes on with these guys. But. You've had some of your short stories appear in various collections and some yeah. of them you're in there with some big hitters. How does yeah. that feel? It's weird. It's surreal. I got sent. I got sent like my uh, author copies of one, um, the same book as like Clive Barker and Brian Lumley and things like. That. And it's just it's ridiculous. I just like to see it. It's like how you know how did this happen? Um, I just feel really lucky. It's just kind of I'd never thought when I was a kid. So that's the, like, the first sort of going back to what you were talking about earlier. My first taste of horror. Uh, I was about twelve. I'd come home from school and my sister's copy of Stephen King's Skeleton Crew was on the table. She had the first edition paperback. You know the big old thing was like a doorstep. Yeah, yeah. I saw it on the table, I was like, cover out with the, you know, the skull on it with the side. And I was like, what's that? And I kind of took it and I just went into the other room and I just sat and I sort of read, read the first couple of stories, read The Mist. And I was just, I was hooked from then. I was like, yes, I'd love to do this for a living. And then, you know, fast forward X years and in books with sort of Clive Barker and Brian Lumley and everything. It's just crazy, crazy stuff. It's uh, weird. I mean, it's, it's one of those things I kind of, I tend not to think about it too much because I always want to kind of keep seeing what's next like well we've done that what can yeah. we do next let's keep going let's keep doing some new things pushing on yeah um like i say i've got quite a lot of things because i've 
output wise, I've not put a huge amount out recently. I've been doing, I've been working on the nonfiction project for the last couple of years. So mm -hmm. fiction wise, my output's not been great for the last two and a bit years. But I have got lots of finished works just kind of sat. I'm just waiting for the right time. I've got two short story collections which are finished, a novel I've almost finished, and a novella that's finished. So I'm just kind of waiting for the right time to decide what I'm going to do with those as far as mm. you know where we're going to place them and you know what goes next. Cause and are you thinking about traditional publishing more these days than indie? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I mean, all power to anyone who can make a living from the indie side. Not all power to you. I know it's, it's massively hard work. Uh, to do it uh, but I just feel like I want to kind of try you know and just try my luck you know see see down the traditional side and just see um, mm -hmm. it may not come to anything but I feel like if I don't try it I'll never know and this newest project that I'm working on is kind of quite not commercial story it's still quite dark but it kind of fits more into us that kind of commercial fiction bracket um, I've been just I've been speaking to an agent on and off regarding that uh, one of the majors from New York for, since November last year They've right. made a bit of guidance and stuff, and they, just, they want to see it when it's finished. It's a chapter away from the end, and then I'm going to probably be editing for another month or so. Um, mm. And get it out to some readers because it's, it's quite complex. Exciting stuff. But that one, I mean, I've got high hopes for that one. Hopefully, it'll do well. That one's called The Sinner. But again, it's quite a dark. It's the first book I've written without any sort of supernatural elements, and it's just like a dark, it's really like a serial killer cult type thing, which is different, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the process. Very good. And how would you say that in working on that book, yeah, how have you changed over the years since, say, Whisper or, or uh, Dark Corners? I think the, the benefits being, more than anything, is by working with, you know, serious publishers and traditional publishers who won't just kind of publish whatever you decide to be like. When you self-publish, you can finish it and get it edited and then you don't have any kind of other buffer between you and releasing that work to the world. The publishers I've worked with will just kind of say, hang on a minute, that's not working. You, we, you know, we can change this, we can edit that, we can tweak this. And they'll just kind of point out things that help me long term, certain ways of doing things. Um, I used to be a horrible for abuse of adverbs and things, you know, like killing things like that often. Um, it's just little sort of iron and out errors. It just kind of makes me more, as I'm writing, I have to take those lessons on board as I'm creating things now. So I try, I tend to be cutting them out before it gets to the stage of going to an edit and cutting lots of those things out based on past experience and past feedback yeah. of what works and what doesn't work. You know? You're cleaning it up in advance because of lessons learned from, from their yeah, critical absolutely, eye. absolutely, because I think without that, it's difficult without anyone to kind of be a filter for your work, essentially, but without somebody else to kind of say, hang on a minute, and be willing to step forward and say, well, you know, this doesn't work or, you know, there's a plot hole there or that's, that doesn't quite work well. Um, it's easy to, without that, it's easy to kind of upload something that's not its best. I'd rather somebody tell me and give me more work to do than just put something out that's substandard. Yeah, so you can bring the best you know? version of it to the service. Yeah. yeah. For example, the third Whisper book, <laughs> Graham will tell you this himself, he had me write the entire thing from start to finish three times. So there were three different full versions of that, three 80,000 word versions of the same story. Christ on a bike. <laughs> but in fact, one's a completely different story and two are variations of the same one. Um, it worked me hard on that. But the end result is the one that he bullied me around and, and pushed and pushed and pushed. That's the best of the versions that are out there. So it just kind of goes to show that, you know, it hurt at the time. I was like, it's frustrating at the time but in hindsight I'm glad he was kind of so strict with his editing and stuff and getting his editors to kind of be really really ruthless and you know and taking yeah. no compromise because that version of the book is massively superior to the first one I turned in and hoped would go out you know it's like they're, they're completely different but the final version is so much stronger than the initial version it's sort of things like that it's just kind of that, that's invaluable that experience from experienced professionals and editors that can help you you'd be a fool to you know to turn that yeah to turn that down, it, it, it's just for a lot of people they won't end up in that position i guess where where they're in the room with the with the editing team sort of thing i know yeah. not literally in the room but you're not yeah. sat at that table it's very difficult to get picked up isn't it's it difficult. it's really difficult and it, it's difficult as well in the indie world which I, I've, I've found this myself it's finding good 
good editors to work with because a lot of people will advertise themselves as editors, but they don't really have any track record. You know, anybody mm. can make a website and say, I edit. But yeah. You need to find somebody who, who's not only good at what they do, but kind of gets what you're trying to get across with your story. If they don't yeah. kind of get what you're trying to get across, then it's difficult. You need to find somebody to kind of mesh with them, kind of they get what you're going for and what kind of term you're going for with the story. Otherwise, they could suggest things that change the vision that the writer has. It's difficult to find yeah. a good balance. And you know, I'm still not settled for my self-published stuff. I'm still not settled on one specific editor. I tend to kind of jump from different people. I've just I'm not I'm still after all this time not found that one person who gets it. Yeah. You know, it's difficult. Yeah, because it, it it's that balance, isn't it, between them helping you bring out that best version but also that being the best version of your story, of, of, of not the their vision. story, yeah. Yeah, yeah. not their version of your story because yeah. they didn't write it. So, Yeah, which is difficult. I mean, it's, you know, like I said, I, mean, I think for anybody that makes a living, like I said before, anyone that makes a living from self-publishing or power to because it's so, so hard, you know, they must work really, really hard mm. to kind of keep, keep working, keep producing. And I know myself, it, it when I was living, doing it for a living, it stopped being fun. It became more of a job, which I didn't really like about right. it. You know, it stopped being something I did for fun. It's like, well, I need to produce X amount of work and push this out and publish this. And it stopped being something that I enjoyed. It became a chore. And I think that's kind of why I stopped, you know, my productivity went down and I stopped kind of pushing titles out and things. It just yeah. kind of, you know, it got to the point where I started to resent doing it. I took a step back. I took a year off. Near enough, I did it. I took a year off to do a non-fiction work. And just left fiction aside completely, which was good. It kind of recharged the batteries. And it's back to being something that I do because I love it now. It's, it's I do it because I like the process yeah. now. And the non-fiction work, I've been kind of wanting, I was going to try and dodge talking about it because I kind of think it's worth an episode in its own right. I'll be honest with you. Oh, um, but, um, should we skip it? Or do you want to, do you want to touch on it? or? <laughs> And then we can, we can see see what people think if we want to hear more we can uh, <laughs> yeah and do another one am i right in thinking this was where you were with a team of uh supernatural investigators yeah absolutely yeah so um, it's that one. yeah i definitely want to do an episode about that like. yeah uh, the, the, the basic concept i won't go into too much detail now is um my sister and brother-in-law they run a um paranormal investigation team uh they don't make any money from everything that they and goes to charity so they everything right. they donate to children's charities whatever they get on the night so yeah. they run it at a loss they run it at their own out of their own pocket mm -hmm. everything that they get on the night goes to charities so i wanted to do something where i wanted to sort of shadow a, a paranormal investigation team because I'm, I'm a bit of a skeptic myself so i thought you know i'd like to know the truth for myself but shadow these guys along and just make my own kind of mind up you know do my own mm. independent investigation at these various locations uh so had a conversation with them and they were like, yeah, come along, do your own thing. You know, we won't interfere. You you do whatever you want. You yeah. come along, you investigate yourself. I've got my own equipment and everything. Um, in the end, we went, it took me a year and a half. I went to some of the most haunted locations in England. I went everywhere from Bodmin Jail to uh, 30 East Drive, the home of the world's most active poltergeist. We went there for two nights. I won't go into it now, but there's some really, really strange things went on. And wow. got a lot of good evidence, which is all on video and audio. And as, as part of the book came from it you can actually as you read the book you, on a specific chapter you can go and you can review the evidence for yourself so if it's a chapter on wow. location x you, you, when it says you know we captured strange footsteps uh you can follow the link in the ebook i can just go onto my website yeah find the video find the audio review it for yourself make it your own mind so everything that we encountered that i encountered myself yeah video audio pictures it's all on my website for oh, the reader shit. to make it their own mind that sounds great. A so year, year and a half and big eye opener. I'm I'm skeptical, but I also I'm like Mulder, you know, I want to believe. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. You know, I I like when you hear a good ghost story and it sends a right shiver up your spine, you know. And I'm not talking about reading one necessarily in a book. I mean, you know, when somebody just tells you that they experience yeah. something and you think, you know, this is somebody who they don't go around talking this stuff all the time. They just, you know, oh, I'll tell you, you know, something weird happened. And, and then you get the story and it puts a shiver right up your spine. And it's not because they're well, a good storyteller. It's because it's genuinely bloody weird yeah, what yeah. they found, you know. Well, that, that's the whole point of it. I kind of, I wanted to be, rather than that person that tells the story, I wanted to kind of 
be there and document it and go, okay, here's what I experienced. There it is. Make up your own mind. It's mm. not it's not a book about me trying to kind of say, well, this was this and this was that. This is supernatural. So, okay, this is what I captured. Make up your own mind. Mm. I've got some weird stuff. I've got I've got like actual full voices recorded, like full speaking full sentences. I've got a, an apparition looking through a cell window in Birmingham Jesus on video and picture. Um, glowing eyes. It's scary. I'll I'll send you that off, off when we get off. Um, oh, that would be great. Video. Yeah. I'll send it over to you. But it's really really good. I mean, there's some some weird stuff. I mean, like I said we'll go into it more if we do a later day. But there's some really really weird weird things went on. And, uh, and, uh, I went in 100% skeptical of it all, and I'm probably about 60 40 towards believing now. Ooh, so. worked on you then. <laughs> that one's a truth stranger than fiction. It is. Is that yep. yeah? I mean, I'm going to put links in the show notes to some of your work anyway, yep. but I will put that one in. Yeah, uh, put that one. I'd be curious. I, I, I kind of, I'd like to see what people think of it because you know it's one of those subjective things, isn't it? The paranormal, like you know, get people who outright believe in it all and believe everything, and then some are unsure, and then some who outright say you know, not all. I mean, it's always interesting to kind of get different opinions on. You know, what yeah, they yeah. There. I think I might have to look up your family as well. Get in touch with them. Oh, they're, they're always, they're, they're always, I mean, they're, they're itching to get back to it. Obviously, the lockdowns put a bit of a, of course. A, bit of a, a, a damper on their, on their exploits, but they get everywhere. They're really, really good. Yeah, we might have to get them on and have a, yeah. have a chat. Um, I'll just, a little plug for them at Veritas Paranormal. They're a little plug for them. I'll give them a little bit of a, a little bit of a cheap plug. <laughs> no, hey, spot on. There's, there's... Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're grabbing massively as well. They've, you know, they're doing really, really well, so. I think they've, they've raised thousands for charity, so it's all good. It's all for a good cause as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'd love to have a chat with them. Definitely, they'll always be up for it. We've we've talked about publishers, yes. but there is another aspect of the <clears throat> of writing that... You're going to say the A word, aren't you? I am, the dreaded A word. <laughs> um, so you've obviously engaged with a lot of... Uh, you know, you, Because you're focusing on the... The traditional publishing route yeah. at the minute and you know you've you've mentioned this things that you know screenplays and things like that yeah. um, and I guess for a lot of newer writers listening to this they might think well you know I've got the writers and artists year book and I, I don't know whether I need to go for a publisher first or an agent yeah. do you have any uh, experience with agents or uh, any thoughts on agents yeah again it's one of those things I mean I've had some experiences some good and some bad I mean I'm, I'm, I'm not going to kind of Going to detail about that, but there've been a few. I've had my fingers burned a few times over the, over the past years with a few who promised lots and mm. didn't turn out to be quite what they said they were on the outside. Um, but on the flip side, especially recently, I've been speaking to an agent for a. And I'm not going to name it now because obviously we're not. I'm not. It's not like a client no. relationship yeah. at the moment. But it's a, one of the New York agencies. I started speaking to an agent from there last December, November, or December about the book mm. that's now The Sinner. And they've been kind of informally helping me out, giving me editorial help, putting me in the right direction, doing sorts of various things. Uh, so I'm hopeful that that might come to something. The one yeah. thing I will say with agents, for any aspiring authors that are looking to kind of deal with an agent, I'll get, you know, get in touch with an agent. Uh, never pay any money to any agents for anything ever, because it's a scam <laughs> if you do. Mm, yeah. And do your research check up on them look at what they've published look at what they've released look and see what their sort of history is if they're who their clients are you yes. know because there are so many chances out there who will call themselves an agent but they don't actually know what they're doing some of them even call themselves doctors yeah <laughs> <laughs> and Very what i'm referring to is that michael and i and several of our uh, writer friends were approached a few years ago and we're I, I must admit Michael I don't know how you felt but I was really excited I was like oh my god you know Thrilled. quit my and, job and everything uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> well I, I was like oh, they, you know this could be a, a new opportunity that it could open some real yeah. doors here and then you start yeah. kind of peeking behind the curtain and it was not all yeah it was one of those be. things like the more the more you looked into the situation the more it kind of got that uneasy feeling in the pit of your stomach kind of thing that this is not yeah. quite it's not quite right you know and it, you know in some cases it may be that somebody's trying their best to be an agent but i think unless you've got those contacts with the majors unless you can kind of get those ins with the big publishers then you're wasting your time yeah you know? i think you need we, to be we, in that upper upper 
echelon of sort of top quality publish uh, agents who have those contacts within the major houses. Otherwise, it's difficult to do anything. And they probably got that from working in an agency. So they've worked up, they started as an intern and then worked up to a junior agent. And yeah. Gone on from there. So it's, it's not going to be one of those things where they're going to be uh, inexperienced. They're going to kind of have years and years of sort of experience of agent and, and, and making contacts. And, yeah, and then they'll have all those ins and they'll know what kind of stuff sells, you know. So, and that's a lot of the thing. It's just kind of an agent's only going to buy something they can sell. It's, it's as harsh as it is, it's a business. They're not going to buy anything just to be nice to somebody. They don't want to take something on that they can't sell. Yeah. And I think as well, just listening to what you were saying before about the agency that you've been in talks with, yeah. listening to the input that they're having on your next project, they really invest in time in that. So they must believe yeah. that this time is, that it's yeah. going to be worth their effort, isn't it? They, they must think, well, you know, because obviously they're looking to get a commission of work they help you yeah. place. So, Which is fine. I mean, if, if they place it with a major, then, you know, I'm happy for them to take their, I think it's like 15 to 20, 22% mm. typically for an major. I'm quite happy for them to take whatever, you know, there could be. I mean, it's nothing set in stone yet. There's a long way to go. It may be that when the book's finished, it may not be right for them because it's, it's yeah. still in that process where I'm still sort of shaping the direction and everything. But that's fair enough. It's just for a new writer, especially looking for an agent can be really demoralizing because there are far more authors looking than agents that are looking for new clients. So the competition is ridiculously overwhelming. Mm. You know, I think I read I think I read a stat somewhere for every literary agent that maybe sort of two and a half, three thousand authors looking for representation yeah. or something stupid like that. So it's it's difficult and it's got to be you've got to have that kind of perfect storm of you like the agent themselves, you get on, they get what you're trying to do, they like the project, they've potentially got somebody further up the chain or I can sell to them or they might buy this. So it's got yes. to be that perfect storm of everything aligning to kind of make that kind of relationship work because ideally it's not a one-off they're going to want a, you know, a career out of you, you know, yeah. after they sell that first book, they're going to be like, okay, what's next? And you need to be able to actually deliver that. You can't just kind of sit on the one book and you need to be like, okay, well, what's next? What you can, you know, what are we selling next year or, you know, what we're selling the year after that kind of yeah. thing. Because they've got so to make sure that you, that readers don't stop asking where, where is your next book? You know, you, no. so you need that pipeline of work coming out to to remind everybody, I'm still here. I've got another story to tell. Otherwise, yeah. all that investment in, the in you is an author. You'll get forgotten about. And mm -hmm. I did actually ask the agent themselves, so what, what is it that kind of, what is it that an agent looks for? What is it What is it that a good agent looks for in a potential new writer? And they said to me, they look for writing history, um, you know, how much stuff you put out. Not necessarily how well it's doing, but if you've got a good platform, that's good. If you've got good social media platforms, that kind of thing, that's all yeah. good. Um, but it's just kind of the look for somebody who they can invest their time and effort in to kind of market as a product. That's essentially what you are. They're, they're selling you as a product and your work. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, as harsh as it is, they, unless they, they're only interested in making money, which is fair enough, like any business. You know, they want to sell yeah. your work to make some money, you know. But it also makes you money, so it's, you know, it's good. You've got bags of experience now under your belt. What advice would you go back? What writing advice would you go back and give to your younger self? Is, is that a nice way of saying I'm really old now? Not at all. I think <laughs> I'm still beating you. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I think what I give my, the best advice I give to my younger self is to just slow down a little bit. Don't try and do everything at once and don't do everything by yourself. Learn from people, like people that have been there, people that are experienced. Take that. You know, take take some time to learn. Um, also, routine is key. Do a little bit every day. Don't beat yourself up if you only do 100 words or 200 words. Just get something down on paper every day. And you'd be surprised how quickly, two to 500 words a day, you'd be surprised how quickly you've got, you know, a novel in nine months, 12 months or whatever. Yeah. You know, but just try and make sure you do at least something every day and a bit of self-belief. But, you know, there are a lot of writers out there and, you know, some good, there's some good up and coming talent coming up. I've seen some, you know, floating around. Um, I've been doing a lot of stuff with uh, more on the artwork side with uh, Kevin Kennedy. He's doing a lot of uh, anthologies and stuff at the minute. He seems to be doing really well. Yeah, he's doing uh, great. He's Ralph coming on next week. He's doing really, really well. So, so, you know, some really, really good top quality authors out there at the minute. It's nice to see the you know, community's flourishing. It's good. Yeah. 
what would be the best jumping on point for for new readers so anybody listening to this who haven't read one of your books before what's the best place for them to jump on i would probably go with whisper it's kind of it's kind of got all the little kind of story points that i tend to throw into my work it's got kind of the the slow burn it's got the tension it's got the kind of you know the the characters are not quite black and white mm. um, so i probably suggest the first whisper book or if you want something with a little bit more kind of action towards the thriller side of it the first project apex book that's kind of more of a global scale thriller type thing um, right people tend to like that one so either of those would be a decent jumping off point and then hopefully buy lots more books you know <laughs> that's it get, get them hooked um well i'll be putting links on the show notes anyway for for all of these things where can people find you on social media mate well, I've got a um, Facebook author page, which is uh, www.facebook.com, Michael Bray Arthur. Um, I'm on Twitter as Michael Bray Off because I didn't have enough characters to fit author, which is quite annoying. Um, I'm pretty much a bit of a, a social media whore, so you can pretty much find me everywhere on social media. Um, I, I spam all. Of, I, I mean, even on Google Plus, I think I'm the only person who still uses Google Plus. I don't even know if it's still a thing anymore. <laughs> I think they killed it a while ago, actually. <laughs> I think it's been dead for a while. I, I had an account, but I don't know if it's still valid. So you may find me on there if it exists. Instagram, everywhere, really. And also my website, that's the most important one, michaelbrayarthur.com. And you'll find all my uh, links and all my works on there. Great. Well, I'm going to get all those links on the show notes for you. Much Thank you very it. much for coming on, mate. It's been a pleasure talking Anytime. to you. And Anytime. I think it's been uh, nice to enjoy it. It's flown by. It's hopefully, we've got some new readers for you who are anxious to Fingers pick up crossed. a copy of Whisper. And I mean, you've been an absolute goldmine of information for anybody who's looking to get into writing or who's in writing and not sure what the next step is. I've learned yeah, a lot well, from that's, you. That's one thing. Listen, I'm, I'm always approachable. If anybody needs any advice, anyone out there who sort of wants to know anything, message me online i'm always yeah. happy to help out and offer advice if i need, if i can help anyone out i'll do it you know, oh, that's anytime. brilliant i'll be at you i'll be picking your brain again but i'd love to have anytime. you back on again we'll talk about some of your other yeah. projects if you're happy to come on yeah by all means absolutely brilliant thank you very much mate i appreciate you anytime thanks for having me and i'll speak to you next time i hope you've enjoyed this episode of fiendish minds don't forget to like and subscribe and follow the link below for today's show notes where you can find reading lists and more information about today's guests thanks for listening Catch you next time.